Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. In this week's episode, Fusion 360, differentiate your products with aesthetic design. Learn how to quickly and easily incorporate aesthetically pleasing and organic shapes into your design using Fusion 360. Fusion merges industrial design, mechanical engineering and manufacturing into one integrated platform that leverages the use of modern capabilities such as cloud computing and mobile device, tablets, access and collaboration. Today's presenter, Jeremy Stegmuller, is a degreed mechanical engineer and an 18-year-old veteran, an 18-year-old veteran of the CAD industry. Over the years, Jeremy's skill have been tested, successfully developing some of the most complex benchmark models ever attempted in today's CAD systems. He thrives on new designs challenges and never met a model he could not build. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our page at Novage.com. And for more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus and Twitter. Coming up next week, Emerging Facade Swarm Design Structures in Grasshopper. Grasshopper has become a standard for parametric and automated design. Such a design is truly bottom-up and emergent. The webinar demonstrates several ways of utilizing swarm behavior in producing various complex facade structures. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded live. If you want to rewatch this or any webinar episode in our collection, just head over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channels. And now I'm ready to pass the baton to Jeremy so he can put on a great show. Uh, you should be able to see the screen. Okay, guys, um, the stage is all yours. Let's rock okay. and roll. Great. Well, good afternoon or good morning or even good evening, depending upon where you are located. My name is Roger Orban. I'm sales executive for Fusion 360. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about the future of design, how you can develop products with wow factor, new products with both form and function that your customers will desire. Welcome to Aesthetic Design, enabled by Fusion 360. Jeremy, next slide. I am sure the first question for many of you is, what is Fusion 360? Uh, in short, it is design reimagined new tools and workflows built from the ground up to facilitate the way products are designed and manufactured today. A new generation CAD platform developed with the latest tools, technologies, and architecture. Next slide. Before developing Fusion 360, Autodesk did extensive market research to determine what designers and engineers really wanted from the next generation design system. From this research, two major themes emerged reduce design tool overhead, and simplify the design data handoff between functional departments. But what was meant by reducing design tool overhead is this. Do not force engineers and designers to think like a CAD system to capture the design. Today, designers and engineers are spending way too much time and intellectual capacity figuring out how to capture design in their mind's eye as valid geometric data in a CAD system. Think about it. Constraints, relationships, dependencies. Can this history tree structure accommodate change? This is not how designers and engineers are taught to think. It's how a CAD system makes you think. As you can see from the slide, there are also many other significant requests that designers and engineers deemed important. Next slide. It was clear that what was important today to designers and engineers is quite a bit different from the requirements 20 years ago when current generation CAD systems were developed. Think about it. Current generation CAD systems were built for a different world. 20 years ago, 1995, a Unix workstation was the platform of choice, although Windows was beginning to come on strong at that point in time. Current generation CAD was designed for one person sitting behind one workstation. Today, Computing devices are varied. It could be a Windows laptop, a MacBook, a tablet, and even some cases a smartphone. In the past, much of product development was also co-located, and thus CAD tools were developed for that working environment. 
Product development today is very distributed, but today's bolt-on systems for distributed product data management and collaboration are very unwieldy, cumbersome, and inefficient. Next slide. So with these takeaways in mind, Audit has set out to create something new and different, a radical departure from current generation CAD systems, a solution that empowers designers and engineers with the freedom to capture designs on their own terms, not the terms of the CAD system. So let's explore the three tenets of Fusion 360, Agile Design, Work Anywhere, Communicate and Share. Next slide. Agile Design. Fusion 360 is an aggregation of best-in-class and most widely used modeling tools from many industries, design, engineering, manufacturing, even gaming, entertainment, and digital animation, modeling technologies such as direct edit modeling, polygonal sub-D modeling, parametric modeling, surface modeling, primitive modeling. All of these capabilities have been rewritten and merged into one system, one user interface, Fusion 360. Fusion 360 reduces design tool overhead, enabling designers and engineers to capture their designs and ideas quickly on their terms, and thereby unleashing design creativity, increasing the exploration of form and function. Next slide. Work anywhere. One never knows when inspiration will strike. Previously, inspiration was captured with a pencil and notebook. Today, these tools are more often tablets and smartphones. Wouldn't it be awesome if designers and engineers were able to capture these tools as an integral part of the design process, to capture their designs, thoughts, and ideas in any device when Providence strikes? This is Fusion 360. Fusion 360 is a web-enabled system providing device independence so that you can work anywhere, anytime, any device. Fusion 360 is licensed to the user, not to your computer. You can access your data on the device of your own shooting. Further, Fusion 360 is architected to enable on, offline work for those times when you're not connected to the Internet. Next slide. Communicate and share. Today's world is collaborative and connected, in, including product development. It's no different. There are typically both internal and external project stakeholders that need to be kept up to date. Fusion 360 includes inherent product data management and collaboration that is transparent to the end user. It is nothing like the clunky PDM systems that are bolted on to current generation CAD systems today. Fusion 360 provides the ability to store and to share your product data in a manner that enables collaboration and at the same time provides granular security and control so that you share what is required, with whom it is required, when it is required. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy Stadmiller, who will introduce you to Fusion 360, the next generation of mechanical design. Jeremy? Thanks, Roger. Um, and thanks and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm so excited to be presenting Fusion 360 to you guys. Uh, I'm going to walk through a little bit of an introduction to the demonstration, and then we'll jump right into it. So today, with Fusion 360, Autodesk is really bringing a new uh, design paradigm to um, to designers out there. And it's not just about mechanical CAD, industrial designers, maybe layout engineers. Why not give them one single platform? But today let's talk a little bit about aesthetic design. So you see here I've got uh, an iHome uh, iPod dock and next to it a wall dock. Which one of these would you like to own? You can take a look at that one in the upper, the iHome up in the upper left hand corner. There's nothing particularly wrong with it, but you look at that and you probably say to yourself, I saw that at Walgreens or some other discount store, and, uh, but really I'd rather have the one that's beautiful, the one that enhances my home or my apartment, the one that makes me, you know, it puts a smile on my face when I look at it. It's projecting quality. It's projecting innovation and technology. Is it really any better? I'm not sure, but just looking at it, it's, it's, it's curved design. It's just beautiful, and it's something you'd like to hold in your hand and feel. So what are the obstacles to that kind of creative design? Things Today's systems are parametrics. You've you got to know where you're going before you get there. I've got to have all my dimensions laid out. Everything's got to be locked down. You're drilled in that to make sure that it happens so that when you make an edit or change, things behave properly. For organic shape creation, all that complex sketching and rules and rules and rules and rules make it very, very difficult to create complex shapes. And then once I do create them, change management's a nightmare. 
In parametric CAD, you go to edit one dimension. If you didn't build it yourself, Lord help you. Um, I don't know what I'm, what's going to happen when I change this dimension and I get the tree of red. Everything just failed. I don't know what I did. I don't know why. All these dimensions are, are changing. Gosh, it's just, it just it's a struggle. You can do it today, and these tools are, are, are fine, but, boy, it's a struggle whenever you want to make a, an edit or a change, especially to an organic design. And finally, integrated idea capture. As Roger mentioned, inherent PDM. Where's my file? Which one is it? Where did I start? Uh, boy, I, I tried one thing. It didn't work. I went down a direction. How do I get back? And I'm managing all this data all over the place, and it's a bolt-on system, and Gosh, I hope I can push my data out to, to, to Asia-Pac where we're doing manufacturing or maybe we're collaborating with Ireland. And, and these systems, they're slow. Everything's kind of moving, you know, sluggishly, and I can't find anything. It doesn't work that well. These are, these are inherent problems with today's design tools. And when you're creatively designing, you want to create multiple iterations, throw things around, and have a free-form environment. When you have a bolt-on system, it just, doesn't, it just doesn't help you there. It just, it's just an obstacle to what you're trying to do. So really, these are just a few of the things that are causing issues today for people creating creative designs. Because you know, you know why you want a creative design? You want someone to pay more for your product, to differentiate it from the pack. You don't want your product to become a commodity. How do I do that? Put a face on it. Make it, make it something that people want to own and want to use. So the demo today, we're going to use an example from wearable tech. Here's a, here's a whole bunch of different uh, prototypes and images. And, and things that people have created to, 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 to build wearable tech, whether it's a watch, a fitness monitor, um, if there are vests out there that are monitoring your heart rate and all that sort of stuff. And here are some examples of, of fitness monitors and, 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 and wrist-based devices that are out there. And I happen to actually own the one in the lower left-hand corner there. That's, uh, that's the Pebble. And uh, I own it. It's because I can never hear my phone ring. I never do, and I, I always need to pick it up but it vibrates on my wrist, and I love that. And I can see my texts while I'm driving. It's safer, but it's ugly. I, I don't really like the way that it looks. I wear it on the inside of my wrist so people can't see that I'm wearing this, uh, this, this, this bulky design. And there's nothing really particularly wrong with it. It's just not for me. I, 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 it, it doesn't have enough curve. It doesn't look, it's not fashionable enough. And, uh, it, you know, whereas you look at that Nike Fuel Band, that's pretty cool. It looks nice. So let's take a look at how would I create something like that. So let's go into a demo and take a look at that. And you know, as I go through this demo, I'm going to make comparisons for existing CAD tools that are out there today. And, and I don't know what you use, um, but uh, you know, tools that I'm familiar with, Pro Engineer, uh, Autodesk Inventor, SolidWorks, I've seen some Rhino. And I, I'm going to try to give you an idea for, for, for the tools that we have here and, and how we differentiate in so many ways. But here's Fusion 360. Uh, you can see I've got kind of a, a very nice, clean interface with different sketching tools, assembling tools. This is a full blow boat design tool. I hover over, I get nice help and feedback. What is this command? How do I do it? How do I use it? I've also got different environments within Fusion. There's the standard modeling environment and a patching environment. If I want to do just straight up B-rep surfacing or boundary representation surfacing, parametric based, make a change and it updates. I've got rendering. I've got animations for exploded views. And let's not forget, Included in our in our base package, two and a half axis cam. You go with ultimate, you're going to get two plus three cam, and it's all HSM works. All part of the product because you know what? You make these products. They're not just imagination and, and ideas. This is a tool that takes what was typically just industrial design or just engineering and just cam. They were all different departments. You'd have different skill sets. We take all those tools and put them together and make them easy to use and integrated right here with Fusion 360. So let's get started. Let's create a sketch. I'm just going to go ahead and say, all right, we'll just pull down. I'm going to create a sketch. It says, well, what plane do you want to draw, draw it on? And we're going to start real basic because I want to get to a feel for how it works. But it moves. I look straight at it. I've got my sketch palette here on the right. It gives me all my different options that are out there. And, and as I go, by the way, um, I am doing this on GoToWebinar, so there's always a lag. Um, I'm doing my best to keep up. I know Roger will pipe up if, if things are really falling behind. But uh, um, I please, you know, Forgive me if there's a little bit of lag between what I do and what, what I say and what I do, but uh, we'll do our best. So I'll just come in, create a center point arc, and look, you know, I get my typical parametrics. I'll come up and say, you know what, I want a radius of 40, hit enter, it locks that out. Now I want to start creating the arc. All right, well, what's my arc length do I want it to be? We'll go ahead and say 65 degrees, hit the enter key, and there it is, and it places that arc out. 
if I right mouse click, I get a lot of nice options. Do I want to press pull or start creating geometry from that arc? Or maybe I want to create another one right away so I can repeat the command really quickly and easily, come off the center and give it a 38 degree um, radius with a uh, uh, 45 degree arc length. And really what we're doing, if I didn't say it uh, well enough there, is we're going to create a fitness band. We're going to create something, some wearable tech for people to keep track of things like steps, like a pedometer, uh, maybe heart rate, maybe um, your watch, maybe you've got text messages, all that kind of stuff. I want to put that on my wrist and I want to create a nice one. So we've got uh, pieces here. Let's go ahead and I can draw a line here. Let's say I want to line it up um, centered uh, with the origin and create an offset. So I just create a line here. Right mouse click that line. If I want it to be um, construction, that pops up right here under my right mouse click. It's also over here in my sketch palette. It's a commonly used thing when you select a line. So I'll select it and it changes it to a dashed line representation. I can quickly and easily add dimensions to this guy. One dimension tool, lots of options. Grab this guy and let's say I want, I pick two lines that are at an angle. So it gave me a degrees here and we'll say I want a 30 degree down from 40. Then maybe I'll select these two lines and I want an offset here of maybe five. And there's my sketch. So you've got all these, the, the, the standard parametric um, tools that are built in here. And the reason I keep mentioning this is um, Fusion 360 is a hybrid direct modeler and parametric modeler, which is totally different in the way that we go. And the reason that this is totally different, it was written from the ground up. It's not a kludge from a system that was originally parametric and then we added a few features that are really technically parametric features to make direct edits and move them around and try to tried to change something that existed to, to, to adapt to, to new technologies. We, we started from scratch. Autodesk said, you know what? The world's changed. We need new platforms and new technologies. I don't want to just port what we have. Let's start over and dominate this market. And that's what this tool is all about. So I've got my sketch here. Let's go ahead and let's extrude some surfaces. So I mentioned direct modeling versus parametric. I'm going to create some sculpted surfaces. Inherently, these are push-pull non-parametric pieces. So I get a dialog box that comes up, and it's very specifically in my face. It's there because for those of us, uh, myself included, who used to be a purely parametric user, this is something different. I'm learning a new tool, and I'm used to having to put a dimension on everything. And when I change it, everything kind of updates or doesn't or breaks or nothing. It's warning me, saying, hey, you're going into an environment that's different. You're, you're creating a sculpt. There's a... Uh, when you want to go back to parametric land, you hit finish and you're done. So it's a really nice way because you're learning a new skill here and giving you power that you never had before. So what are those powers? Watch, I come in here, just like any other kind of uh, feature-based tool, I could say, all right, let's go ahead and extrude. I'll grab this edge here, and I've got all sorts of nice options. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's give it, so let's make it symmetric about the face. I want to embed that symmetry so it always stays that way, which is a really nice option. And then we're going to come up and we're going to say, okay, let's type in an offset here of 12, and you see it creates a surface. But it's got multiple patches on that surface. Two, in fact, and there's the number, and we're going to get into what that means here in a second. But we're doing something called subdivisional modeling. And if you, if you got uh, Inventor or SolidWorks or Pro-E, you may or may not have these tools. You likely don't, and definitely not with the power I'm about to show you. It's really cool. So we'll hit OK. I'm going to turn that, uh, it automatically absorbs the sketch, I can turn it back on. So what I want to show you down here, it's a feature tree. I created a sketch, and now I'm building a form. This is a parametric feature tree. The sketch is based, the form is based on the sketch, and it's creating it here. But I've also got a navigational piece up here where I can say, well, what's a part, what isn't, where does the sketch reside, really nice interface. We're going to come in and just repeat extrude. We're going to give it similar op uh, options and say symmetric. And we'll go, this time instead of uh, 12, we'll go 10. And I still want to embed that symmetry and hit OK. So now I've got two surfaces here that I'm going to use. Remember, I'm creating a fitness band that goes on your wrist. So we'll turn off the sketch, but I need to connect these two surfaces. How do I do that? I guess I could have drawn it in there and kind of lofted something together. Or I'm going to use a command called bridge. What bridge allows me to do is I'm just going to double click one line. It grabs the entire length. And then when I go ahead and double click a line on another surface, it automatically says, well, that must be side two, and it switches for me. Really nice, cool interface. And what it's asking me is it says, hey, do you want three faces to transition from here to here, or how many? I'm going to say two, 
And what you'll see when I hit OK is it creates a nice loft of transition. And notice, two faces between the two. And if I look, it's trying to maintain curvature continuity as I go, and I'm getting really nice modeling. All right, well, this is not exactly going to stay on my wrist if I hold it there. I, I think it needs to be more of a circle. So I'd come in here and say, all right, let's uh, mirror or circular mirror this particular face. You see, all right, we'll pick it. And because there's no sketches on right now, and in fact, there aren't any in here that I can use, it says, well, maybe you want to use the existing origin axis to, to mirror about. Really smart, you know? I mean, it's really giving me the tools that I need right away. So I'll select it. Uh, it does three um, in there. And now we've got a 360 of this model. We'll hit OK. All right, but we've kind of got a little bit of an offset issue here. Let's come in and do that bridge again. And I'll double click this first one and second one. And again, we'll do two faces. And when I do that, it joins them. But because it was a pattern and because it's inherently symmetric, it filled all the other holes together. Really nice interface. So it's kind of cool. I got a nice shape here. I can rotate and look at it. This would go nicely around my wrist. But if I got an existing CAD tool today, I could probably do this. I, I would say, you know, I don't know if you could do it as fast as I did it because you'd have to come in maybe and draw each arc, maybe an interior and exterior arc, and then trim away parts of the sketch and then create some sort of transition. But then how do I deal with the fact that it's transitioning here as well? You know, there's, there's, you know, you could, but you could do it. You could do it. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. You could do it. But what if you said, all right, well, that's all fine and dandy, but I really want this to look nice aesthetically. So if I grab this top edge here, I'm going to hit edit form. And this is the juju. I mean, this is the stuff that's really cool within our sculpting. I can take that face and grab this. This is going to scale it in X and Y. I can drag in X and Y, but I'm just going to scale it. Look at that. I drag this in. And it's parametrically scaling it. So I can say, well, how far in do I want to go? Drag it in, drag it out, push in. But it's automatically creating nice contoured surfaces. Let's type in a 0.9. In other words, kind of like uh, out of 100, right? 1 to 0. And we'll say 0.9. And now I've got this curved face all the way around. Imagine trying to do that in your current CAD system with lofts and sweeps and getting both curves right and the transition in and out. I'm doing a lot of talking, but that still only took me, what, 5, 10 minutes to, to, to blast that out? I can knock this out in like a minute and a half if I really, or a minute maybe, you know. Let's, but there it is. Pretty cool. Now, let's take a look at a little bit more of those tools just so you get an idea. So what these are, they're, it's subdivisional modeling. If you're not familiar with it, these are subdivided faces in each one. I can take, say, for example, this face. I hit the Control key. I can select multiple. When I hit Edit Form, I got all sorts of options. So if I look at the top, I can drag it in a direction. Hey, how about that? And everything's updating. I can rotate this way, or I could come and rotate that way. Different options. I could slide it in an XY direction. So this triad gives me so much power to click and move and drag and scale and do all sorts of cool stuff. But does undo work? Absolutely it works. And so there we go. All that, all that undo was specific for this feature. But when I hit OK, all my other undos are still there. Let me say that again. While I was in edit form, I was doing all sorts of dinking around and pushing and pulling. The undo was specifically for this feature. And then when I released that feature, I got all my other undos back. That's power. Like, you know, because you're just you're playing around. You want to get something right. And, and boy, oh, boy, um, I really like the option to go back and say, hey, I didn't want that. Let me undo. And it's all good. So we'll go ahead and hit Finish Form. So what does that mean? Well, that means I'm leaving my sculpted environment. And guess what? It created a surface, a BREF surface. For the question earlier, I could export this to Rhino, and it would be a totally legitimate BREF surface that you could play with, monkey around with, and away you go. In fact, here in my list, it shows up as a surface. It's a different icon. Now let's go ahead in here and say, all right, well, let's add a thicken to this. OK. I'll come in and say, all right, let's go ahead and grab that. And notice I've got all my different tools in here, push, pull, whatever it may be. We'll go ahead and say thick, and I'll pick that face. And just like any other we'll, you know, tool, we'll say minus 2, and I want to thicken to the inside. And what I've got is a parametric thicken. It's a normal thicken. It's exactly 2 millimeters. It will always be exactly 2 millimeters, and that's parametric. So I've integrated direct modeling and parametric modeling. It's really awesome. So, OK, so but so what does that mean? Well, if I come back and right mouse click and hit Edit Form, and then take this face here and say, grab it, 
drag it out and make one of those crazy changes. When I hit OK and finish the form again, it rebuilds and the, sur and the surface and the thicken adds. So imagine, you can create all sorts of different options. And notice I've got here, I've got uh, bodies and surfaces and all that different stuff in there. So it's an integrated, uh, let me see here. Hang on one sec. My, the questions dialog keeps popping up from GoToWebinar. Sorry, I, I fixed it. So, uh, you know, I've got all those pieces there, but let's go back in time a little bit. Let's use that undo again. Look, here it all is. Undo, finish form, edit form. I there's the thicken. I can all, go all the way back to undo finish form, and it undid all of that and actually took me back into the command. So that undo is granular to the command level. It's really awesome. And the reason why I wanted to come back here is I wanted to show you the parametric thicken, but we've also got thicken here in sculpt. So why would I have that? What difference would that make? Let's select this guy, and let's give it the same options. We'll say minus 2, and you see it starts creating it's a little bit of a preview there. But my options are a little different. Sharp would be like we saw before with a sharp, hard edge. No edge would be like a surface offset. In other words, no, it's not actually thickened. It's just did a surface offset two millimeters in. Or I can do soft. Watch what happens when I do soft. Now what I've got is I've thickened it, and it created a smooth transition all the way around the surface. That is awesome. And guess what? The inside is a whole other sculptable surface. So I, if I want to take and say edit form and grab that point and drag it out in space, I can do that and edit the inside independent from the outside. That is some real power. But I, I don't want to grab that. Now, if you look at this, it's pretty nice. But, you know, the curve to the, on the outside matches the inside. But really, if I want this to be comfortable on my wrist, what I might want to do is double-click that inside edge here and let's scale it in to make it a smoother inside. And in fact, I can type in a .9, and now I've got a flatter. Instead of really concave on the inside of my wrist, it's going to lay flat, and it's going to feel good like I know it's there. Or maybe I'm going to put leads and contacts close to the surface so I can really measure and monitor heart rate. So it's awesome. So all right, let's go ahead. And there's all sorts of tools in here if you want to go ahead and do soft modifications, different edits and changes. We don't have enough time to get into it, but there's just so much tool, so many tools in here to create really complex surfaces. So we'll say, okay, now, when I hit finish form, what happens? It says, well, I need, you know, what does it look like? like maybe three surfaces to create that. And there it is. So you can see top surface, bottom surface, and then it's all see, uh, got a seam here. But in general, the system automatically converts and creates a B-rep surface. Well, what if I want to define those surfaces? I can go right back and edit this and say, you know what? Instead of you deciding what surfaces I have, I want to decide. So I'll say convert, and what edges do I want to keep? Real simple. Double click them. There they go. And let's say I come in, we start adding and creating these. And there we go. When I hit that, and then say, OK, it converts to solid, and notice I've now got the surfaces that I that I decided I want. We'll go ahead and hit save. We'll uh, call this uh, no veg fitness band and hit OK. As soon as I hit save, it has saved. Guess what? I'm working locally, but instantly the cloud has this data as well. Well, almost instantly. And as long as it takes to throw up a few kilobytes, the cloud has been updated. We'll get to that in a second. But let's say I want to, let's get a little bit better idea of what this is going to look like. So I'll right mouse click and say, let's change some appearances. Up it comes built-in photorealistic rendering. So let's go ahead and say, all right, let's do some plastic here, opaque plastic, maybe black glossy. We'll pick faces to do and maybe do the inside face there and the inside face there. That looks pretty good. And hence, you can kind of see now why I maybe wanted to pick the surfaces I wanted to use. What about, uh, let's grab this red and drag it on the top face, and then drag it on the bottom face as well. And now I've got that. But you know what? I didn't want red. Let's go edit. I can edit it. It's got a full, full range of colors, and I can create custom libraries and all that kind of stuff. You can see how the model is updating as I drag this around. I want it really hot, a little bit browner. You know, where do I want? But I want this to be orange. And there we go. And we'll hit save, and I'll just type in maybe uh, added uh, appearance. Okay, and I'm done. Boom. All right, cool. Now we've got this guy. This looks pretty good. All right, but um, we need to be able to charge this. 
right? So how do I make a charging stand? Something, this is pretty organic, right? It's a nice size, it looks good, but I need to have a physical model. I'm going to mold it. I got to put a charger in it. Maybe we'll do induction charging. Maybe we won't. How am I going to create that? Well, let's just go ahead and create a sketch and build a, build a platform for this. So as I look at it, we'll say, okay, let's go ahead and create a center rectangle, drag this out like so. And maybe I want it to be, what's 85? That's about right. I'll hit enter and uh, should we make it square? Okay, 85. And notice in my sketch palette over on the right, I've got options for the different types of rectangles. I can switch and swap and move. I've got all my different relationships right at my fingertips. But we'll hit okay. And there is a sketch out there in space. Now, this is, uh, I'm not going to get too depth in depth in it, but I, I call it single modeling environment. This is, you know, what's a part, what's, a, what's not. I can choose at any time to say, take this and make it a component. Assembly hierarchy is no longer a restriction. You don't have to start with parts, put parts, hope that relationships get added, create in, independent pieces, and hope that they all update and work with an old structure with independent files. This is all one project, all one file, which is now a quoted term, it's not really a file, and it's all together, and I build structure when I want it, and I design when I, uh, when I want to. It's awesome. Don't be, don't be constrained by having to have certain things be parts and sub-assemblies before you even design them. You can build them, put them in place, and then from there decide what's a part and what's an assembly. So let's go ahead and create another, uh, another piece in here. We'll create that base. And, you know, I just did this in the center, but we'll go ahead and create it. And I'll just say right mouse click, press pull. This is kind of a catch-all. When I hit press pull, it says, all right, well, you, you did press pull on a sketch, so I'm guessing you want to drag it down. All right, so we'll go down maybe 15 millimeters. And notice I can add the draft as I want. Okay, so we'll go maybe 15 degrees. Why not? We'll keep it simple. And there we are. And you see it creates a new body, gives it a distance. I can do symmetric, all those great options. But there it is. But that's kind of encasing it a little bit too much, I think. So let's go ahead and move it down. Well, how would I do that? I can just come to this body and say, let's go ahead and move it. And in there, I can move that body any way I want. In fact, here, let's do it again. I'm going to right mouse click and move. And it says, okay, where do you want to move it? The reason I did it again, because it allows me to say, well, where do you want to move it from? I can actually pick key points on the model as my move location. Isn't that cool? Like, instead of just picking the centroid, it's giving me an option to say, all right, let's pick move from there. And that's why I changed it. So we'll look at the front and let's drag this guy down, say, maybe, you know, six or so. And there it is. And we've dragged it down. So now it's going to be sitting in there, right? Then we've moved it, and it's in place where I want it to be. I didn't have to worry about offsetting my sketch, getting it in the right place. You know, when I offset that sketch, I put a dimension to it, which means that that better be updated, and I hope that offset works with the origin, and I better think ahead about how I'm going to do that. Why not just design? Why not just build it, move it where you want it to, and make your direct edits when, when necessary, and make your parametric ed edits when they make sense? So we'll come in here and say, all right, well, this has got to sit inside, right? And look at the front here. That looks pretty good where it's sitting. Um, let's go ahead, and I'm going to do a combine. So we'll say target body. I want the base, and I would like to cut it with this piece. So instead of joining, we're going to do a cut and hit OK. And what it does is it cuts this, this shape out of that one. And let's go ahead and select this guy and just show high. You can see I've got a cutout. And that's exact. it's exactly the same shape as the other body. But there's a problem there, right? Like, if you're going to try and put that in the groove um, to make a change or to, to charge, you would have to really dig with it and get it just right or it won't fit. So we better put some offset. Try this in your parametric system. Let me grab this surface and, again, press pull. This is inherent technology in our geometry engine, in our modeler. What do you care? But it's built in. You don't care how it does it, but watch it do it. And I'm just going to start dragging that surface back. We'll go minus a half. I don't care how that was created, and the system just builds and updates. This is technology that we built in here. Maybe I want to take this space here and do the same thing, drag it in like this. And I just want to move it. Hey, I even got it just right, 0.5. And now we know that when I slide this in, it's going to drop right in. Try that in your parametric system and watch it chunk and kind of go, oh, I don't really know if I like this, and move. It's because it's some patched kludge thing to make it work. This this kind of direct modeling is built into the software as a key tenant of how it works. It's just awesome. Okay. 
So uh, we've got this face, but if I'm looking at this, right, um, it's kind of more of a Walgreens type look. It's a flat surface, right? This is this is something I might see in the checkout aisle. I want to add some contour. I want to add some some surface uh, quality to it. Something to make it look like something that's pretty. But what if I just came in and said, all right, well let's do something called edit face. We grab this face. And you see here, that's starting to look like one of those uh, subdivisional patches that you saw before. I can pick this point here and that and that point there, and I can hit the control key and grab them and it'll move it over, or I can do it again. And I, this time I'm going to select all four corners. Zoom over here. So by selecting all four corners, why am I doing that? Watch as I scale it out. I'm going to take this surface, make it a little bit bigger, and then let's go ahead and drop it down, say maybe minus six. So what am I doing? I'm taking that face and I'm making a complex curve centered on the model and I just pulled the points of rotation out and when I hit OK, the surface now takes on that shape. This combination of parametric modeling, surface modeling, what about the, notice it just did this face, not the middle face because that's the only one that I picked. But yeah, but those were faces that were created all at once. How does it know? It knows. I can select this face, right mouse click, again, repeat edit face. Let's just grab the center here, and let's go down again. We'll do the same value, minus 6. It doesn't matter. I could just drag it. And now I've got kind of a, a convex or concave, concave. Convex, concave, convex, concave. I remember my, my terminology. But it looks great. And you can imagine now when that band comes on, it'll slide right on that curved surface and hop and drop right on in, in there. That's pretty awesome. But, you know, so let's this is the front. I can see here. You know how I know? It's labeled front. There it is. Uh, but what about the back? You know, everything's got a 15-degree angle, but on the back, I kind of want to differentiate the back. Maybe I'll put in a USB port or something like that. I don't want that to be 15 degrees. So do I got to go back and find that? Or how did I get there? Was it a cut? Was it a chamfer? I don't know. Well, who cares? I'll just right mouse click and say, let's move that face. And when we look at it, let's just take that one face and rotate it 15 degrees back up the other side. Direct modeling. Awesome. Just that one face now is straight up and down. I could also click and drag it out, scale it in and out. Lots of options. So there's my shape. What about adding some fillets? Okay, let's go ahead and actually, instead of using the fillet command, watch. I'll grab an edge, right mouse click, press pull. Drag it in. That's that press pull, right? I can hit. Uh, I can grab more edges then and add them to it. There we go. And let's say, I don't know, 20. That looks pretty good. Uh, what about... Uh, this time we'll just use the regular fillet, and I'll grab the, this edge here, that edge there, and this edge there. Maybe put a one millimeter on the top. We got variable radius. We got all sorts of different options and pieces built into the system. It's really, really cool and awesome. So, all right, let's turn this body back on, and uh, that looks pretty good. But let's add, let's make it look a little bit better. Let's add some appearances. We'll come in and say, you know what? Instead of a uh, plastic, let's do like a metal flake, a black metal flake. And we'll drag it on there. And it says, hey, there's already an appearance on this. Would you like to remove it and add this one? Absolutely. There we go. And so now we've added kind of a metal flake on there. What about different logos and pieces? I've got to sell this and make it look right, right? So we'll come in and say, all right, well, how about if I go ahead, let's go into our rendering environment. I can do it from here, or I can go to the rendering environment. Notice it changes. It looks much nicer. It kind of turns on all that rendering. That way, you you know you design with performance. When you go to render, you get a little bit prettier view. And let's add, for example, a decal. And maybe we'll do it on this face. And I'll go grab that decal. And let's grab, I've got an image here. It's just a JPEG. But it can be any kind of standard image. And we'll move it around. Notice it's mapping the face. This is so easy to do. But again, all part of the software. Click and drag and move and rotate. That looks pretty good right there. There's some monitor information. And we'll hit OK. What about we'll do another one here? Let's add another decal. You know, on the front, this one's going to be uh, maybe a medical, uh, that medical symbol. I, oh, I forget what it's called. I used to know what it was called. We'll drag this in, drag it over. So this is, this is more of a, you know, monitor. Maybe someone's got high blood pressure or they're, you know, high risk of, of whatever, diabetic, you name it, and they need fitness uh, pieces. And this allows a parametric or someone to know, hey, look at this. This is an important piece. We'll say, okay, what about maybe the inside face here? We'll come in, add another decal. We'll go fast. Got to give homage to the boss. Come in here. Uh, we'll look at the top. Rotate this guy about where I want him. Put it in there. And there we go. We'll hit OK. 
and there's our piece. I can do all sorts of different options like camera settings, perspective, focal length, depth of field, all built into the software. This is all included in Fusion 360. Stuff like environments, different you know, rooms and lighting scenarios. I can play with the lights, rotating them around, turn on different reflections. Let's go ahead and save this guy. Say, you know, added uh, base and appearances. And I don't have to. I don't have to type in this, but it helps. And I'll show you why in a second. We'll do this. And, and now, I can, I'm doing rendering on the cloud right now just by hitting save. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. But I can also do rendering locally. And what the reason why is Fusion wants to give you interactive performance, this ability to create and move designs and create them quickly and easily. And when we look at the infrastructure that's out there today, to kind of push all that information live over uh, the Internet, it works, but it's a little slow and clunky, and we couldn't give the, the, the experience that we wanted to give. So we pushed things that that were better off in the cloud, up on the cloud, and left interactive stuff on the, thick, on the client here. It is a thick client, but it's very, very small. A typical major CAD package install, 7 gig. This is around 800 meg. This product runs on Windows. It runs on a Mac. It's architected to be very, very lightweight and run. And in fact, we just announced that we're going to be coming out with a full web version. So if it's appropriate for you, maybe you don't have your computer with you and you want to use the web version and use, run directly in Google Chrome and design right from there with no install, no problem. Guess what else? This is architected from the ground up, so no more OpenGL graphics cards. I can't imagine anybody's ever had a graphics driver issue using OpenGL because only engineering software uses it. Everyone else uses DirectX or some other tool because it's new and it's, it's, being, it's been adopted. This is DirectX will run on any computer with any graphics card. Obviously, the more horsepower you have on the card, the better off you'll be. But, but those are just some of the things that, 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 that are so diffi that are, that are difficult that have been a pain in your, and, and, and a thorn in your side that we're fixing. So let's go ahead and close this. I can look here right in my data panel. Here's my, my project. There's my fitness band. This is a window up to the cloud. All this different information. In fact, let's go to the cloud and take a look at what's up there. When I hit the button, it pops up. And I already have the, the web browser open. It's got three new posts. Oh, Roger even already started notifying, hey, he made a comment. Because the instant I saved this, he's a member of my project. This is Google Chrome, by the way, web browser. Totally uh, independent of any other software, totally thin client. And he said, you know what, I want to get a render in what? You know what, Roger, uh, will do. Uh, let me get at that after the web client. After I, you know, after I show the web client. And so this is true collaborative feedback. When I hit post, he can see and rotate and look at the models. In fact, here it is. I can come in and select this. This is all, again, in Google Chrome. So when I select it, it's going to bring up uh, the, uh, the viewer. Now, it's pushing all this back and forth, so it's a little slower than it is normally because of all the data that's going back. But it's still pretty quick. And so here's a built-in 3D viewer. You can send anyone with a link this view. And in fact, you can change the different views. So, so if I want to come in and say, you know, give me grid light. And there, this is all, anyone with a web browser can do this. On, you can do it with iOS. You can do it with Android. You can do it anywhere you want. And in fact, notice here as well, here's a list of all the history. You saw me saving and making notes. It's tracking every single time I save. It's giving me a version. Have you ever gone out and, and, and said, you know what, I'm at a, a design crossroads. I'm going to pick a direction. I hope it's right. I could go one way or another. I hope it's right. And then you realize after working for a day or two or even a week, you know what, that was the wrong path. Do I got to start all over or do I and remodel or somehow try and there's no undo all the way back five days? How do I do that? Well, with Fusion, I could just come in and say, hey, you know what, promote this version. I can go back to any time I saved and it tracks all of them and start from there and branch off, make a new part, bring them back together. It's all being kept. And what do you care? You get unlimited storage on the cloud. Unlimited. Unlimited collaborators. This is really done right. If I want to, I can share a public link so people don't even have to have a login to see this if I really, really wanted to put it out there. 
other things that are up here in the project. This is really key. So Roger's in there. I've got I've put up here some PDFs. In fact, uh, I found a Forbes article about wearable tech and how health insurance co companies are using this to monitor their uh, their patients. And I put it up there. So instead of this information being on your hard drive in my documents or wherever it may be and nobody can see access, you put it up on the project. That everyone who's collaborating can see what you're doing and why you're doing it and where'd you get your ideas. Put your intellectual capital online and share it. Truly, truly collaborate. Make comments, put in there, so on and so forth. There's also things like wikis. So if I wanted to come in here uh, within the wiki, and I've got different options, for example, of let's post, you know, wh what do we want our fitness band to look at? Let's look at different options that are out there in the market. So, for example, I can click here on this wiki, <clears throat> and it brings up some JPEGs that I have that I found online, and maybe we want to look at this, maybe we don't, um, and, and away we go. So it's really, really cool and awesome. It takes a, the, the web, it's a little, a little slow because of my go-to webinar is hogging my bandwidth, but there it goes. So you can see, you know, there's the different images and pieces out there. So imagine, instead of having wondering where people are or how they got where they're going, you could, you've got all those things at your fingertips. Also things like a calendar, you know, like what are my project dates? It's all fine and dandy if you're internal and uh, you uh, have Outlook or something like that, but what if you put in your project dates and when I'm going to, what if you're collaborating with a manufacturing house and you want to set a date? They can access this. You put all the information there. There's no doubt. Single version of the truth. All the information's right here. Access to all your data right within the web interface. Click, move, push things around. All built into the software. All part of it. Inherent PDM. Really, really cool stuff. So uh, let's come in here. Let's go. So what did we see here today? We saw, you know, how... Fusion 360 uses direct modeling in conjunction with parametrics to make it easier to be creative. Make your changes with direct modeling where necessary and parametrics where opportune, where it's appropriate. Organic shape creation. Use our sculpting tools integrated with the parametric power to create those really complex surfaces that used to be so difficult. Change management. Easy to understand and edit the feature tree. Move things around. Make those changes. Multi-platform. So if someone wants to collaborate and say, hey, let's change this, let's move that around, or I need to move this data or copy this part, I can do that from anywhere at any time, along with that integrated idea capture. Data management is inherent and cohesive. As Roger mentioned before, typical CAD tools use a file-based system based on Windows, really NT, if you think about it. They all kind of came out, the current tools kind of came out uh, early to mid-90s, depending if you're talking PTC, or SOLIDWORKS, or, or Inventor, or whatever. And the internet didn't exist, as Roger said. Or if it did, it was its infancy. There were workstations, and files, and you created links. That's an outmoded concept. Fusion 360 gives you these tools. So we saw a lot of things, but and we didn't really highlight some of these other major things. Again, runs with iOS, runs with Android. Right now, it's viewing and collaborating. But that's all available to you. Rotate, move, runs on Windows, runs on Mac. You want to use a Mac? Knock yourself out. It's inherent to it. And coming soon, you of course can web browse with Chrome, but coming soon, we're going to have a fully web interface, full web interface. The software was architected that way from day one. We just want to provide you the proper solution that gives you the performance you want. Instead of putting you on the bleeding edge, you're on the cutting edge. Autodesk is responsible. We're going to make sure that you have the right tool and the performance is good. Built-in rendering that I mentioned, HSM works. Full boat cam built into this. Uh, you want to print this? Oh, you know what? Here, let me quick come back to uh, Fusion here. Watch, I can come in and say, you know what? Let's go ahead and file 3D print, integrate it into the system. What do I want to print? Maybe just the fitness fan. Do I want to preview the mesh, look at different pieces, send it to a 3D print utility? It's inherent. Autodesk is doing all sorts of things to make manufacturing different. I don't know if you know this, we built an entire facility where we do our own manufacturing. Why? Well, one of the reasons is, how do you really know if your tools work and what the challenges are of users if you don't try and do it yourself? We are not. We don't want to be a monolith software company that doesn't actually make chips fly, doesn't actually make things. That's what Fusion and Autodesk is all about. Translators, use the power of the cloud. These are all the, the files and more that we handle. We handle a lot more than this. 
Import your Rhino files natively. Alias, PTC, SolidWorks, NX, Inventor, Katia. And you know where we translate that stuff? On the cloud. It's awesome. You just upload it up there. Now you don't have to worry. Is this a 10,000 part assembly? Do I have enough memory? Do I have enough horsepower? Is it going to sit and chunk and then finally spew out because my machine didn't have enough memory or I'm not really sure? That's a perfect application for the cloud. What versions do you support? Well, guess what? It's on the cloud. We can update our translators whenever we want. You don't have to wait for Service Pack 3 or 4 or version this or that to get the latest version. By the way, versionless. There's no such thing as an out-of-date version of Fusion. You don't have to worry about communicating with anybody. Do they have version 12 or 14 or 2005, 2012, whatever? Versionless, easy communication. How do I get the file? It's on the cloud. So if someone wants to send you a file, you don't have to worry about pesky FTP sites that really aren't secure. We have a fully secure, backed by Amazon, uh, cloud solution. You just give them a link to the project, they upload it, and it translates on the cloud for you, and it's ready when you want it. Unlimited collaborators. I could invite everyone on this webinar to my project, and it doesn't cost another dime. You can all look at it. You can all comment on it, view it, move, move things around. It should be free to collaborate. You should be able to invite people to things. You're the one creating, authoring these pieces. It's really awesome. You need to be able to share it. That is inherent in the system. So that's my presentation. Uh, we are, I don't know what time we're at here, but uh, we can open it up for some questions um, and, uh, and, and, and talk. But uh, again, you, you, you can buy this uh, right online. If you've got a, uh, an Apple, go to the Mac App Store. You can buy it from there. You can go to the, uh, the Autodesk uh, App Store and buy it directly from us. Um, and, and download it and look at it. It's really awesome. But uh, oh, someone asked, uh, can you look at uh, a section view of two parts? Absolutely. Oh, you know what? I didn't even have. Ah, man, you know I get so excited. Uh, if we come in here, uh, here's a lot of different tools: curvature comb analysis, zebra analysis, section analysis. So if I want to come in and do a section based on maybe this surface, I can drag it in and out, rotate, you know, from there. So full section, of course. Uh, and the other Jeremy one that I wanted to show was, let's do a curvature comb uh, analysis. Uh, my windows are kind of covering it up here. Uh, not curvature, excuse me, curvature map. So I can pick this surface and it'll add a map to it on top. So I want to turn yeah. off my details and stuff, but there's a curvature map analysis on top as well. Jeremy, uh, there was a, a series of questions that uh, I, I answered many of the questions as we were going through the the demonstration, but there are some that would probably be best answered by you. Okay. So if you go to the questions and look at it, show answer questions, make sure that it's unchecked, right? And then oh, you'll see the questions that I have not answered yet. Okay. So, okay, show answer questions unchecked. There we go. And hang on one second, I'm just navigating. Oh. And some of them, well, there's a couple, I think. And the only one I can see. No. I couldn't assign them to Jeremy, to both of you, so I assigned them just to you, Roger. So if you want to, if you don't mind, um, read them to Jeremy. Certainly. And I'm I will, okay. I will as, as soon as you read them, I will then assign them to him if I can. Okay, there was a question, there's a follow-on question, and I believe this question is with regard to importing alias data, bringing alias data into the Fusion 360 environment. Yep. Um, could you address that? Sure. So we handle native Fusion, uh, or excuse me, uh, we handle native uh, alias files directly in here. Um, and what you'll get is uh, the actual VREP surfaces, which we could map um, some of our subdivisional tools to, or you could trim away and use. So they're, they're very usable surfaces that are in here. And, and really, with alias, it's this thing. It's like, what are you trying to achieve? Alias is kind of the gold standard. It can do just about anything. Um, Fusion isn't isn't at the alias level, and, and we didn't expect it to be. It's, it's what we're trying to do is give more surfacing power to your typical engineer. And we're adding more and more, and we, that's not to say we don't take tools from alias, but alias is this, 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 this monolith of really cool stuff. So the reason I say that is there may be things you want to do. It, you, know, you start your design here in Fusion. You could pass it over to alias, finish it off with some really finite control and things that alias is really good at in there, or vice versa. You know, you've got some really complex piece that you want to integrate in existing mechanical design. You can import it here, cut with it, thicken it, all that kind of stuff. So it really is a nice kind of handoff between because we do handle native data. Next. 
there was a question, uh, I believe it was about Wacom support, Wacom tablet support. I'm sorry, I'm not, wa wa Wacom, Wacom? Uh, I'm not familiar tablet with support. that. I remember seeing something that it's coming, I believe, but I thought maybe you might have some more information. We'll have to get back on that. I'll have to get back on that. You know, we, right now we support uh, iOS and Android. Um, if this tablet is a certain ta different tablet or operating system, we'll look at it. But the nice thing is, is the software is architected to be kind of platform independent. We can push it and move it around as the market dictates. Um, so, but you know, without knowing more about that, I'm sorry, you you you, you stumped me on that one. I hadn't heard that term, so we can get back to you. Um, Jeremy, I must I just assign a couple of questions to you. And the sure. first one says, uh, how do you show your measurement on screen for blueprints and machining? Sure. So, uh, for example here, uh, we do have built, I didn't even get into the drawings and stuff, but I can come in, let's see, I probably want to close this. We do have integrated drawings. It's, it's, it's uh, um, fairly uh, new. Uh, right now, so it's 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 really, but it's really nice. So we come in and say, okay, let's select. I want to select that part. It asks me, do you want the whole assembly or just that part? <clears throat> and it switches and moves me into the drawing environment, and then I can, you know, place those views as I see fit, and hit OK. And notice that oh, we got color now. This, that's awesome. Uh, you know, we're releasing software. Oh, I must have picked the top. We're releasing software um, on an eight-week release cycle. And so we're getting new functionality really, really quickly and fast into the software, so it's awesome. So now we got section views in there. Awesome. Look at that. That's great. This, was, this release came out last week. And you might say, oh, gosh, I don't want to update my software all the time. That's really a pain. Remember, it's cloud-based. So a lot of that stuff's happening on the cloud, and you don't even see it. And when you launch the software, it just says, hey, I'm updating, and it happens in the background. You don't have to download any executable. You don't have to go out and figure out if it's going to work. It's really, really cool. So. A lot of different options uh, built into the software. So the next question is coming from an artist working in the game industry, and he says, um, I'm wondering uh, about the potential of Fusion 360 for game art, hard surface modeling. Could this potentially replace a package like 3DX Max for modeling? Um, you know, that, that depends on what you're trying to get at. The, the issue with that is, of course, you could, you could use these models in any of your gaming type scenarios, but um, engineering software is hyper accurate. <laughs> so it creates uh, complex 3D shapes on the screen, which might bog down what you're trying to do. So absolutely, you could do that. Um, what I will tell you is that Autodesk is creating a, has created a platform for these types of tools. So will someday maybe 3ds Max be on this platform? Absolutely. I don't know of any plans, but it could be. Because the world is moving and changing, and Autodesk is keeping up and morphing. So those tools are going to need to be leverage these technologies as well. So while you might not use Fusion for that, because it's just a little too engineering, you could, but it's a little too engineering. Uh, uh, if the question is, am I going to be able to get this in the product the, the, uh, on a cloud-based type thing, absolutely. Uh, I think that's going to be in the future. When, I don't know. I don't think there's an immediate uh, plan for that. But, or I'm sure there's a, a plan for it. I, I don't, I'm not privy to that. It's not my group. Or they uh, just... Let's see here. Thanks for the great webinar. Is there be any support for... Uh, so uh, there's all sorts of new functions coming uh, to Fusion on a uh, eight-week basis. Um, there's a lot of tools that are coming. Uh, and if you want to go look, it's so awesome. Let me go show you. You want to know how we're different? I'm going to show you how we're different. I'm going to go here. I can go... I'm going to launch our blog. This is just our public website. And in here, I go to the blog. You can do a search... You can find and we post what we're planning on putting in the software. When's the last time your CAD company gave you a list of what we're thinking about putting in and what the schedule is? We may or may not make that schedule. We're not worried about being embarrassed about that. We'd rather be transparent, give you that information when you need it, and have it available for you. It's really awesome. So we're posting that. So if you've got questions about specific functionality that's coming up, so like here, Kaching posted about this last preview that came out. It's really awesome. What's in there? What's out? But this is what's out. And I know in here. And then, see, he puts links here, idea station request. So better undo and edit form. That came in this release where I could undo just in the edit form command. But you can go to our idea station and look at what everyone's asking for. What do they like or not like about our software? Look, it's not a perfect software. There's things that, that are missing. There's things people like. 
but we're putting it out there and saying, you know, instead of us going in some black box and trying to guess what you want, let's community and crowdsource this and do it right. Let's be a cat company that really communicates, gives people what they want. So uh, one of the questions was kind of like, what's coming here or there? That's a place you might want to go look. Uh, we're happy to have any other discussion about it. But uh, let's see. Uh, web client. Uh, will the web client allow change and modify of color? Oh, the question is, will the web client allow the change and modify of color and material of a part without having to have fusion? In other words, can I change colors and things without actually having fusion? Check. I, yeah, it's a great question. So watch as I come in here. This just came out a few weeks ago, or a month ago. I don't remember. I, Roger, you might remember. But watch as I come in here and I open up that 3D viewer. This is, again, in Google Chrome. I can come in, and there's different options. I can come in and look, and I can say, uh, where did it go? It's in there. I have the ability. We have the Autodesk. Uh, there's a uh, uh, beta. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's in my renderings here. When I open this up, there's a beta for uh, our, our web platform that allows you to do exactly that. And I don't know how far I want to get in this, but you see, when I look at these, these renderings happened on the cloud, by the way. It just did it. When I hit save, it just did it. But I want to change it and look at it. Watch as I open up interactive rendering right from within my Google Chrome. My session starting. I don't know how well this is pushing out. I can drag materials, colors, changes, all within a web browser. So. Your wish is my command, all built in there, and, and it's, it's available to, to, to anyone. And that's, that's something right now, it's in beta. You don't have to have Fusion to do that. Um, uh, I'm an alias sketcher from Automotive. Fusion's awesome. How, I really would, how T-splines can achieve continuity to imported nerves. So Tommaso, Tommaso's asking, how do we kind of match T-splines, which T-splines is that sculpted environment you saw. I try to stay away from buzzwords as much as I can to important nerves. So T-splines is a push and pull. Tommaso, we'd love to show you a demo of how to do some of that stuff. You can match, uh, match T-splines to existing geometry, whether it's a solid nerve or a surface nerve, and then knit those together to make a surface. So that's, that's, that's kind of the short version of how you can do that, but it is possible. Uh, graphics Fusion uses DirectX. How does it run uh, on uh, Mac OS and CircuitX is, is Microsoft technology. William, I don't know the specific answer to that. Um, to be honest, that's a, that's a background issue, but it, uh, a, a back-end issue that I don't have knowledge of. But it does, and it runs great. So uh, maybe on Windows it runs DirectX, and on Mac it runs something else. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I'd, I, we'd have to get back to you on that, to be perfectly frank. Do we have an animation feature? Absolutely, we do. You saw in the, you know, we don't have time to go into it today, but if I look at here in the model, see I got animation as an option. So go ahead and look on, on our web browser, our web uh, our web page. There's lots of cool stuff on that. Uh, is your cloud data private? Absolutely and fully secure. Uh, we have a we have a security page uh, on our website that talks about it. But instead of going out and buying some cloud provider and taking it internal and trying to create um, security protocols and then have to justify all of those, Autodesk did a smart thing. They went and said the gold standard in cloud-based uh, storage and technology is Amazon. So right now we're running on Amazon because it's the gold standard. Tomorrow there might be a new gold standard. We can move and shift as necessary. So uh, your data is very, very secure. It's more secure than your email, I can pretty much guarantee, unless you're using one of those really, really uh, funky ones uh, that, that's not as prevalent. But uh, it, it, it's very, very secure and really great. Uh, when will Fusion get particle systems? Uh, I'm not quite sure where you're going with that, Ivan. Um, if you're talking about flow analysis, we are putting our flow tools uh, on this platform, and that will be in the near term. If you're talking about flow for particle systems, if you're talking about ray tracing and bouncing, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it could mean a lot of things, but uh, it's out there. Uh, Confusion import a sketch as a reference to start modeling. Absolutely, Tommy. That's Tommy Wang. Uh, absolutely, you can do that. If you look here, um, I've got this ability to insert an attached canvas. So I can place that kind of anywhere on, on any face or on any plane and draw to it. I can also insert SVGs and have them use them as sketches as well. Really cool stuff. 
Uh, let's see, what else? Where am I going here? I'll keep going as long as people are here. Will we be adding CFD? That's to my point that I made earlier. We will be adding CFD uh, to our platform. Uh, I don't know what the timeline is. It's, it's underway. Um, it's happening. But when it's going to release, I don't actually know the answer to that. So yes, Owen, uh, we are adding it. Let me kind of scroll through make sure I miss some of these. Uh, library materials. Uh, the library materials for rendering large and expanding are the materials customizable? Absolutely. So Peter, uh, when you saw me create that color um, and I adjusted the red one to more of an orange, I can save that then in my back in my library as, uh, as something to use over and over again. So absolutely. Uh, Fusion has an export to Mudbox. Uh, Jeremiah Bigley is asking uh, Fusion to Mudbox, an example where exporting to Mudbox might be useful. You know, I don't, I don't have one, uh, to be honest. I'm not that familiar with Mudbox, so I have a little out of my league there, Jeremiah. Uh, we can try and find that out for you. Jeremy, that Mudbox is, is another Autodesk product, and I believe that's, uh, it's, just, it's brought in as, as a mesh model, polygonal, uh, a polygonal mesh model. Right. No, I mean, I'm familiar with Mudboxes, but what the, the question is, how might it be useful in parametric modeling pipeline? I'm not, I don't oh, really. Oh, okay. gotcha, gotcha. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Ed, you did ask earlier about importing point clouds. Absolutely, we can import STL in different formats. Um, from there, you can drape T-spline or, or sculpted surfaces over those over those uh, pieces and make surfaces from them. So that's a that's a long. There's a long answer to that to show, but that's the way it goes. Opacity maps. Can we use opacity maps? I'm not quite sure what that is. What you're what you're asking, but if the, the question is, can I take JPEGs? And, and change their transparency, absolutely. So if we do an attached canvas, and let's just say, for example, put this on this face, drag it over. This is just from before. Um, I can change my opacity. And it does honor alpha layers um, built into the JPEG. So you see there, it's there. So there's a canvas in the background. If anyone wanted to see or do, we can do that. Um, so I'm not quite sure. So there's that. Uh, flow control and part checking for injection molding uh, from Jeremy Nolan. Uh, we uh, both flow is an RS product, and we're working on that as well for this platform. But there currently isn't a solution in Fusion 360 for injection molding analysis. Was the question? Uh, what products available on the market today exclusively use Fusion 360? Brian, there's a lot of uh, products out there today being designed and developed. I would encourage you. The question was, you know, who's using this? I'd encourage you to go to our gallery and take a look at some of them out there. Um, you know, uh, naming naming names sometimes gets a little tricky uh, with uh, rights. I got to ask their permission first, so I'm not going to throw them out there. But I got I got a lot. Uh, but we are fairly. We have over uh, five thousand active users. Right, that number's right, 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 Roger. Five thousand five hundred monthly active users. That's correct. So those are people who are actively using the software. This software is a year old, and it has come a long way from when it came out this time last year. And we know that there's 5,500 active users. We can't see what you're doing, but we know when you're using it. So it's not shelfware. That's that. You know, we have 5,500 people actively using this software. Um, how many companies that is? I'm not sure. Um, you know, the number's a little bit less because there's multiple people at different companies. But it's probably still up there. Uh, at last count, it was 1,800 companies. I'm sorry, 1,800. Did you say? Yes, at last count, it was 1,800 companies. That's correct. Uh, frame generators, uh, custom beam sections from William Hunter. Right now, we don't have that. We're looking at it. Um, we're, we're looking at that. There's ways you can get that done. There's tools you can do it. But we don't have a frame generator type system today. Uh, it's on the list. It's on the list. And Satish is asking, how do I access the beta website for modification of color and material? Um, Honestly, that's that's from uh, Autodesk. A360 is the platform. I, I don't want to get too far into it. A360 is the platform. If you have a model up there, again, you select it, bring it up, and you look at the renderings tab. And this is for Fusion. There's other tools that do this. When that when those pop up, you'll see a pop up for I want to use Autodesk. A, it's called A360 Beta Interactive Rendering. I'm sure if you did a Google for that, you could get more information on it. Uh, but that's I don't want to get too far into it. Uh, technically, that's part of our A360 platform. That's all part of Fusion. 
for bringing these technologies together. Uh, can I consider Fusion 360 to fully replace my parametric CAD system from Lewis? Absolutely. Um, but that's a, that's a question. Uh, the, the answer is absolutely yes, you could. You know, can Fusion replace a SOLIDWORKS, an inventor, a pro -E? Absolutely. But with anything, you'd want to take a look at it, let us show it to you, help you use it, and determine if it's got what it needs to get your job done. Um, uh, you know, uh, with anything, you, you, you want to make sure it's there. We're not gonna, I'm not going to blanket say that we can do everything and anything. We can't, but we can do a lot, and it's really cool. And I think you can see from today's presentation that the platform's there, that this is going to dominate mechanical CAD in, the, in, a, in a couple of years, like year, one year, two years out. It's just awesome. So, Lewis, yes, you can consider Fusion 360. Please take a look. We'd be happy to help you do that. Uh, but is that... If I design something in Fusion 360, can you import directly to Inventor? Yes. Uh, we have an Inventor uh, native output for, uh, from Fusion today. Uh, that's from Jeremy Nolan. Uh, yes, you can do that. We have that native output. In fact, check it out here. I can, I can do exports right from the web interface, which is really cool. So uh, do I want to hit export from there? Or I can do it from my thick client. Oops, wrong button. Uh, export. There's I just step there. Um, from the web interface you can get uh, Fusion as well. So let's say if I want to export this. So when I hit export, this is this is uh, right from the web interface. So if you want to send someone a model, you just send them a web link and they can download in any format they want, but there's Inventor right there. Uh, for it'll, I'll put an IPT or I, or I, what is it, IAM, IPT, yeah, or a zip. And there's the options. But again, they don't have to have Fusion to do this. They, you just got to invite them to the to the web client. Awesome. It's free. So cool. Anyway. That is uh, cool, John. Printing machine, can you export STL? Absolutely. If you want to just do STL, it's right within the interface. Uh, you know, you saw here under export, uh, 3D print, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me, 3D print. I can just pick uh, STL as my output, and it'll just save out at STL. So yes, the answer is yes. Well, that was our last question. You guys were so efficient in uh, replying to all the inquiries. That was a lot, there were a lot of them. Uh, what a show! Thank you so much. This was super exciting, and a lot of people are asking when can I watch it again? Uh, will you post it? It will be posted on YouTube and Vimeo on the Novet channel as soon as you know I wrap this up. So. Um, stay tuned and uh, please watch it again, share it and, uh, and all that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Roger and Jeremy. I will uh, have to take the screen back. So sorry okay. about that. I know uh, it was a great show. Totally worth thank it. You. And a lot of people uh, sent a great feedback throughout. So I, I want to thank everybody uh, for attending from the Novage team. And I would like to encourage you all to visit the Novage page and uh, check out Fusion 360. Novage is the best way to buy design software online. So check it out and, um, you know, um, try it as soon as possible. Um, also, I want to remind everybody that for information on the latest specials and new releases, um, you can always follow uh, Novage on Facebook or Plus or Twitter. And the upcoming webinar next week will be Emerging Facades, Swarm Design Structures in Grasshopper. Grasshopper has become a standard for parametric and automated design. To rewatch today's uh, webinar or previous ones, check out our Novage YouTube and Vimeo channels. Our webinar playlist as webinars for every software taste. Thanks, thanks again for joining us today. I want to um, thank you so much, Jeremy and Roger, for being with us. and and put out a great show. Uh, uh. Thank, thank you, Barbara. And, and you know, I want to I want to add there. You know what? This is a really easy to use software. But anyone who picks up anything new needs help, needs support. Make sure they get them through. And people like Novedge, that's who you want to buy from. You want to get be able to have someone to to answer your questions and and get through. So I hope you really liked it today. But uh, support is 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 just as important to us, and that's why we partner with people like Novedge. So please uh, go ahead and take a look and, and, and get it from them. Thank you, guys. We really are legit, and um, I hope you uh, you know you under you will get a chance to try our customer service, and um, you know let us hold your hand.
Thank you so much then. Um, it was a great pleasure hanging out with you guys and um, follow our next following webinars and check out the recording on our YouTube and our channel. Bye everybody. Bye Jeremy and bye uh, Roger. Bye now. Thank Thanks you very everybody. much. Bye. Bye now.